Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, someone's, someone's mic is. Mic is. Let's see here. Okay, so hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, if you guys have your mics on, go ahead and, and mute yourself. I think most of you guys are muted. All right, and then if you guys could put it in the chat window, if you guys can see my screen. We'll get started here. Okay, um, so hopefully everyone was able to get into this meeting as it's a Teams meeting now. Um, we're switching over to that, so we figured we'd give that a shot and see how it goes. Um, the recording is in process. Looks like Kyle started the recording. Um, so today is the fourth CAD webinar. Um, the topic is on intersection details um, from model to sheet. Uh, so this was, uh, if you remember from previous months, this one was an open topic uh, session and I sent an email out a couple weeks ago asking for topics on what you guys would like to see and um, I only got one topic, um, which is this one. So because he's the only one that submitted, he got the whole, the whole session to be about this. Um, so the when I get to the slide ahead, I'll talk about the upcoming uh, CAD webinars and the next open session. So um, when that comes around, I'll send another email out. And if you guys have things you want to see, make sure you respond to that that email so that that we know and we can we can start planning and preparing for it. If you um, you know email me or IM me, you know the day before. And it's not really giving me much time to prepare for it. Okay, um, so just some overview things, and then we'll get into the the actual webinar. Um, I showed this last time. Just wanted to remind everyone that our our training um, right now is is on hold. Um, so the the next one we have is in August. So we will see where we're at um, with with this. Um, hopefully that's we're back running by then, but uh, right now it's it's up in there. Um, again, our wiki page, um, all the recordings will go there. Um, after within a couple of days, we'll get the recording up there. Um, so, and as always, there's plenty of good content on our wiki page. Uh, monthly webinars, you can see the ones we did, the one we're on, and then you can see the next kind of tentative schedule. Um, so about every four months, we, we kind of do an open topics one, but, you know, we can shift things around. This is a tentative schedule. But, so the next one will be on, on May 27th, and it'll be going over advanced corridor editing stuff. Um, and just another reminder that our bi-monthly open sessions are also on hold. Um, that's one that we have in the computer lab um, every other month where you can come in and and we're down there, we can work through problems. Um, so that is as well on hold for now. Um, our internal CAD managers meeting, um, so this is more on the manager side. Um, we did have one last week and the next one is, is in July. So um, just thought I'd kind of make that aware. These meetings are, are you know, not, like everyone doesn't need to come to this. It's not like a CAD users. It's more of a managers um, to go over things. Um, not so much using the product, but changes and, and whatnot. Um, so hopefully after the meeting, they are relaying things we talk to you guys as well. Um, and then our, our CAD user group meeting or ex that's open to everyone, including externals. Um, you know, we normally have them in the auditorium and we stream it online. Um, the next one, you know, isn't too far off. 
Um, I don't I I think for right now is isn't really going to be canceled. We're looking at moving it online and seeing if we have that capability or because I I know they'd be a a pretty huge number of people listening online. So making sure that we can actually handle that. Um, so that's what the next one is. We're looking at doing online. Most likely won't be in the auditorium or in person at least. And that's all my spiel that I had. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Ivan, who's actually going to be um, doing this this uh, CAD webinar. Uh, so Matt, can you share your screen? Yep, let me know when you can uh, see it. I can see it. Okay. Um, so I, my name is Matt Ivan. Uh, I just wanted to give a quick background on myself. And JD and Mark had uh, sort of introduced me in a couple of the previous calls, but uh, I just thought it'd be helpful for everyone to maybe hear my background. Um, prior to joining ODOT about six weeks ago, I had 22 years experience working with a few consultants here in central Ohio. Um, the last 16 years were with CH2M Hill, or what was later became um, Jacobs when they acquired CH a few years ago. Uh, I wore several hats there, including a regional leader for our U.S. North, or it was we called it our Civil and Transportation Platform Technology Group. It was um, to be a resource for regional staff and guidance and, and automation support. Um, this had a few other responsibilities, but it was a really a small percentage of my time. Um, my main responsibilities were, uh, which was about 95% of my time, was what we called a project automation lead. So it was basically a CAD manager assigned to each project. Um, and the automation lead was really responsible for all aspects of a project's plan production and delivery. Um, so I'd often be tasked with a lot of roadway design tasks and, and really in short, I had a similar role to probably many of you on this call today. Uh, a designer, CAD technician, CAD manager, mentor for younger staff, um, sort of a liaison for all the disciplines in the project. Uh, just because in that kind of role, you have to be familiar with everything going into these plans. And I, you know, I worked on all kinds of different projects, all different sizes, major interchanges, design builds, uh, widenings, intersection improvements, bridge replacements. Um, so there was often a lot of challenges with funding constraints in the regional position and, and trying to balance that with the project responsibilities. So that's why this position really appealed to me. Um, and I reached out to Rachel when I heard that there was going to be an opening. Um, so I wanted to spend more time with the support and development side of things. Um, so here I am. Um, feel free to reach out. I'm working with JD and Eric as they sort of get me up to speed on the background of a lot of things. Uh, that were decided prior to me coming on board. So uh, I look forward to working with everyone. So as JD sort of mentioned, we're going to talk about um, modeling an intersection and creating the detail sheet with ORD. So we'll start uh, with an overview of how to model the intersection. Uh, in this case, it's a widening. And then we'll go over an overview to create and annotate art intersection detail sheet. So what we'll need to start is we need at least a existing ground terrain model and uh, excuse me, um, we'll need some uh, baseline or centerline geometry. I put a little asterisk there at the end. Uh, we could get away without it in this scenario, um, but it's definitely helpful to have. So then we'll go over uh, an overview of creating the sheet and annotating it. Then we're going to use the ODOT Create Design Files app. We're going to place some name boundaries with ORD. Uh, and then we'll use the Ohio DOT Intersection Details app to annotate um, some of the edge of pavement lines. So as JD mentioned, this, this topic came from Scott in District 11. Um, so when he reaches out, please be uh, I'm uh, sure to submit any ideas that you have um, and we'll, we'll see what we can do to get them uh, presentations like this. 
so once I got some clarification on what the request really was, um, it was mostly geared towards creating the sheet, uh, but it also included, we wanted to also include the demo of, of maybe modeling this widening. So there wasn't anything wrong with what the district had once I looked at their files, uh, but I sort of maybe took a little different approach. So we'll, we'll take a look at that here. So as I said, this, this is going to use a data set from District 11, and I was using ORD 2020 Release 1. Um, JD, do we know where that stands as far as being pushed out to everybody else? Um, hopefully um, soon, the next week or so, um, hopefully we're pushing this update out to all machines. OK, thanks. So there, I don't think there's any differences between the the last release and the 2020 release one and what I'm showing, but um, I just wanted to point out that that's what I was using. I also referenced a draft or an unpublished published version of um, the plan and profile sheets uh, training guide, which is like section 800. And there's also the 508 intersection detail exercise and video on the wiki page that will be a good reference if you want to come back to something like this. Um, and uh, I believe Bentley also has a good video or exercise on some of their learning content too, if you, if you wanted some, something a little different. So this was the project, um, State Route 149 and I-70, and it looks like we're, we're widening um, both Ramp A and Ramp B, as well as State Route 149. I'm just going to focus on Ramp A. The workflow for the rest of it will be all very similar. So these are the steps that I used or I'm going to use to create uh, my model. First, I need to create my KM or my modeling file. I'm going to use my or the RO dot create design files application. And I want to be sure to use a uh, design seed, a 2D design seed. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach my BK or my geometry files and as well as my existing terrain model or my field book file. I'll set my train as active, um, just like you would normally do when you get in to create any any mo file or model or create any civil geometry. So then I'll create my geometry for my socket line and my edge of pavement. And what I just wanted to do on this slide was list the commands that were used so that if you were referring back to this later, you could uh, easily find the commands I used in this presentation. So single offset, partial, uh, variable, variable offset taper, and arc between elements. I'm getting a lot of feedback. You've seen a lot of muting their mic. So then we move on and we'll use the um, geometry commands, uh, profile by slope from element, and a quick profile transition. And then on this slide, what I was trying to show was, um, well, we need to create a, a proposed terrain model. For, so we'll create a surface for that. And then in parentheses, what I showed was um, where you can find these commands within the ORD ribbon. Um, so once we create a, a terrain model, we'll apply a surface template to that. And then obviously before we do that, we'll need to create a surface template and similarly with um, a linear template we're going to use we'll create a linear template and then we'll apply that linear template to create our shoulder and add our end conditions for our grading so um, as my first presentation of this group i wasn't about to attempt a live demo so i recorded this um, and there is audio to go with it so if you can't hear anything um, feel free to shout to get started with my, my intersection model here, what I want to do is go to the ODOP workflow and use the Create Design Files tool. And I'm going to filter the list um, by the KM files, and I'm going to toggle that on. And for this example, I'm just going to use the file number of 901. And I also like to just toggle on, if I'm only creating one file, open the last file. So click Create Files. And 
now I'm in my KM901 file. Next thing we need to do is we'll go back to the Open Roads Modeling workflow and we use the attach reference to attach my fieldbook file as well as the geometry collector file, the BK000, which has BK1, 2, 3, and 4 attached to it. Add that to my list and hit open. Next, for my field, I want my attachment method here to be coincident world. But one thing I want to change at this point is I don't want this to be like nested. I don't really need anything there. So I'll toggle that off. And then for my BK000 file, I do want live nesting, and I will toggle that on and set my nest depth to 1. Now if I fit my view, I see my project area, and we'll zoom in. Next, I'm just going to use the search ribbon to find my level display um, dialog box, and I'm going to just turn off some stuff to make it easier for for us to work on this model. So the only thing I really need at this point is um, the existing pavement levels. I don't really need the joints or the center of the pavement. Uh, I also want to turn on the boundary for my terrain model from the field book file. So I need to turn on the existing ground and the, uh, the tin hall uh, level. In my DK file, I can toggle off some of these if I need to. Um, I don't really have to, but I'm going to go ahead and toggle off the uh, everything except the 100 foot levels. And I'm going to go ahead at this point and just do a, a save settings just in case I, and, you know, I lose the file for some reason. I can come back and it should be in the same view, the same levels turned on and off. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and activate my terrain. And so I'm going to select, using the element select command, I'm going to select the terrain and when the toolbar pops up, the floating toolbar, I'm going to go ahead and select the active, activate terrain. So that'll go ahead and create the 3D model in the background for me. And at this point, I don't need to do anything further with it, but we'll come back to that here in a few minutes. Next, what I'm going to do is go ahead and create a stock cut line along ramp A and a stock cut line along state route 149. Before I do that, I want to point out that I want, I'm going to use the feature definition toggle toolbar. Uh, if you don't have that on your screen, you can find it from the um, from the standards pull down and it's under just feature definition toolbar. So what that will do is set the active feature definition for all the proposed geometry I'm going to draw. Um, and I don't have to change it from each command as I work through these. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and toggle, or I'm, I'm going to dock that in a second. But before I do, I will set the uh, feature definition to uh, proposed stock outline. And I'm going to select this toggle, this first toggle here, which is use active feature definition. And to start the stock cut on ramp A, I'll zoom in here. And I want to start by using um, the single offset partial command. And I'm going to select the I'll toggle these off for now. I'll, ta I'll select the baseline, and it's going to ask me for my offset. Obviously, in this case, um, well, not obviously, but I want this to be a zero offset from the baseline. And it now it's asking me where I do I want it to begin. So I can use the arrow key to change where I want to uh, where this to begin. And I can enter in a station or I can data point and begin point. So in this case, I want to start at 1275. And then a data point to accept that. So for the end, I can do the same thing. Uh, but here, I'm just going to come back and just select a point and data point to end my line. Next, for the socket line along uh, State Route 149, I'll select that center line there. And I'm going to enter in my 12.9 foot offset. And I want that to begin at 123 plus 40. So I'll data point to accept my begin point. 
and same thing here. I'm just going to extend this so these two overlap and I don't want to mirror it. Now I'm just going to go to the drawing tab and use the regular microstation trim to intersection command and go ahead and trim these together. Now I can move to creating my edge of pavement lines and my radius return. So if I zoom out, I'll start down here in ramp A again. And on my feature definition toolbar, I'm going to go ahead and select my edge of pavement line. And move back to my geometry tab. And I'm going to go back to the offsets and tapers. And in this case, I want a variable offset tapers. So I, can, I need to first locate the element I want this to be on. And it's going to be on the baseline of ramp A. And I need to define where my start point is going to be. So my start offset is going to be zero. And then I need to tell it what station to begin it at. And here, I could have gone ahead and snapped to the beginning of the socket line, which is where I want to start. But I, now I can also enter in, again, use the arrow key to move to the um, distance field or the station field and enter in 12 plus 75. So that's going to be a data point to accept, and that's going to give me my begin point. Now I want to enter in um, the end point, which is going to be an eight foot offset. And it's going to be at station uh, 13 plus 25. So a data point to accept the end of that. And I do not want to mirror it. Now I'm going to create an edge of pavement line that's uh, eight feet offset from my baseline. So I'll go back to offsets and tapers. And I'm going to go and use the offset, uh, the single offset partial command again. And I'll select my baseline. Let me clear these. So to start this, I'm going to snap to the end of my taper that I just created. And then to end, I want it to be at uh, 14 plus 85. And then I'll data point to accept that. Now I'm going to create the radius return, which has two tapers in it. So under my arcs command, I'll go to arc between elements, and I'm going to use taper, arc, taper. In a situation like this, I would probably recommend going ahead and entering in the information in the dialog box versus the heads up prompt, just because it can be a little less confusing. Um, so now it's asking me to locate my first element. And so that's going to be my edge of pavement line that I created. My second element is going to be the socket line of 149. So you see it's showing me what's going to be created. And heads up prompts are giving me all the same information that I've already entered here. So I want an 80 foot radius and I'll accept that. Um, and then I want us to trim only the back element in this case. I suppose you could also trim the socket line in this case. Um, but for now, I'm just going to set it to back and I'm only going to have it trim off that little bit of excess there. So there we have our socket line and our edge of pavement for our intersection widening created. Next, what we need to do is define a profile for each one of these elements that we created. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do to start is I'm just going to right click and hold hold that down until I get the pop-up menu here. And I want to select the 3D view plan profile and 3D option. I'm going to cancel this dialog for the moment. So here I have my plan view, my 3D view, and I'm going to use the view at the bottom for my profile here in a second. Uh, in my 3D view, uh, a lot of times by default, a lot of your levels will be on. It might be confusing and, and jumbled. So in this case, everything's been turned off uh, except the triangles. And sometimes what I like to do also is change the display style of that model just to make it a little easier to look at. So I'm just going to use the smooth option. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and open a profile model and I'm going to start with the socket line of ramp A. So I'll use the open profile model and 
select the plan element for the soft cut line. And then I need to data point to select the view that I want to use. So now I have the existing ground profile along this soft cut line. Obviously, we don't need to create a proposed profile here. We're going to use this and we'll set the uh, existing ground as our active profile. And when we do that, we'll see that that socket line then appears in our 3D model. And we'll do the same for the socket line along 149. And then that line also appears in our model. Next, we'll need to select or create profiles for the uh, edge of pavement line. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to use the complex um, by element command to join together this taper and my um, tangent that's parallel to my baseline. I'm not going to include the radius return for two reasons at this point. Uh, in all likelihood, you'll probably want to design this uh, or design a better profile along this return. And the second reason is, and I'll show you once we get into modeling this further, is this is going to overlap with the, um, we're going to create a linear template or a linear, yeah, we're going to apply a linear template to these, which will essentially create two corridors along each one of these elements, and they're going to overlap. So what I want to do is show how we can clip that out. So, and, and then I want to join this end together because when we have this, we're going to end up having a gap at this vertice here. Um, so to avoid that, we, if we complex these by element, and I'm going to make sure that my method is set to manual, and I'm just going to select these first two edge of pavement elements. So now if I select those, they should appear together. And I'll go ahead and open a profile model for this. So the next thing I want to do is go ahead and create a profile by slope. So I don't want to define the profile of this edge of pavement line based on a slope from my soft cut line. So from the element profiles pull down, I'll go to profile by slope from element. And I'm going to locate the element that I want to profile. And you can do more than one uh, element if you had them. And then once I accept that, it's going to ask me to locate a reference element. In this case, I need to make sure I select my saw cut line. So if you notice, when I've been hovering over this saw cut line in my baseline, you'll see that the, the baseline usually is selected first. If I right click, it will switch to the saw cut line. And then I can accept that because that's what I want to use. Next, I'll enter in my slope, which is already here for me. Um, negative 1.6 percent and I'll data point to accept it and then I'll data point to accept the rest of these defaults and again we'll see that the profile is automatically set to active and so it shows up in my 3d view and I see that that was, was drawn in, or that profile was created so next I'll go back and I'm going to look at a profile along the radius return. So I'll create my profile view here. And in this case, you probably want to go ahead and define a profile um, of your inter find your intersecting points and define or design a profile through here. Um, I'm going to use a tool, and I'm not not that I'm a huge fan of it, but for this demonstration, it's going to be quicker. So I'm going to use quick profile transition. Um, before I do that, though, if you want to go ahead and define or design your profile through there, what you can do is use profile intersection point, and it'll show me the elevation of the intersecting points here. So what I'm going to do is if I select profile intersection point, so I'm going to select my radius return, and then I want to it's asking me to locate what element which it intersects. So I'll select this first edge of pavement line, and I'll select my socket line over here. So you'll see in our profile view, 
a point was placed in. This is the elevation of the um, edge of pavement at this point. And then I also have a point that matches existing um, at my socket line there. So now I'll go back and I'm just going to do a quick profile transition. And I want it to be parabolic. And I want us to define it along this radius return. There we go. So now we have our profile along our radius return. And you'll see then that that profile automatically became active in my 3D view. Next, what I need to do is I want to create a terrain, a proposed terrain with this shape that we just generated here. So what I'll do is, um, let's see, let's go ahead and just turn off our reference files just to make this a little bit easier. And when I go to the terrain tab, I want to create a terrain from the create group and I'm going to create it from elements. And in my uh, dialog box here, it's asking me for the feature definition. Um, for the moment, it doesn't look like it's taking what I have set. I'll just toggle that off for now. And I'm going to set my terrain by using the proposed boundary. And I can give this a name as ramp A. And I'm going to set this by boundary with a max triangle length of five feet. We can change that or we don't have to use it. So I'll locate these elements to add, reset when I'm done, and then accept through the prompts or data point to accept these prompts. Okay, so notice that because my socket line was extended beyond this edge of pavement line, I, I got these extra um, triangles here and these extra boundaries. So let's undo that. And I'll go back to drawing and I'm going to just trim the socket line to my edge of pavement line. And go back to geometry and, or excuse me, terrain and from elements again, and I'll give this another try. And set my name again. So select them and I'll reset when I'm done. And then again, I'll accept the data point through these. So there we go. So we see the blue boundary is our terrain. And we can use element select and select this terrain You see, maybe be. There we go. And in my properties, I can turn on and display my contours so I can see what's going on here. I could also turn on break lines or boundaries or, um, or triangles as well if I wanted to see those. So there we have a terrain model or surface terrain model of this intersection area. Next, what I want to do is, is create a, or use some of the modeling detailing tools to create or apply a surface template. But before I do that, I have to actually create my template. So from the corridors tab, I will go to the create template dialog. In my project ITL file, I have one that already created a demo folder. So in that folder, I'm going to create, it's not a new folder, but I want to create a new template. And I'm just going to call this um, surface for now. And I want to build this like I would build any other one, any other template, except I only want the features that I want to display on the surface. So, or the components that I want in my surface. So I'm going to use the, the ODOT components and go to pavement and build ups and I'm going to use the uh, jointed concrete without stabilization and all I need to do is drag that into my active template and let me first 
Um, just toggle on. Let me just set my step options to 0 0.1, 0 0.1. That way it'll snap right to that um, dynamic origin there. So I'm going to leave everything as is, my point names and everything. I didn't apply any affixes, so I don't have left or right. You could do that if you wanted to. Um, so I will save my template. And we'll go back to the modeling detail and apply surface template. So what we need to do here is, is just go ahead and define the template that we wanted to use. So I'll go back to my demo folder and select surface. And it's going to ask me to locate the terrain model. And I can just accept through a data point to accept these. And when I do that, you'll see that the terrain model was applied and or the, the surface template was applied. It's a little bit difficult to see in my 3D model here. So let me go in and let's see what we can turn off so we can see this. So you're seeing the contours and the triangles in this view because I turned them on. Um, previously, so let's try and turn those off here. Okay. So now we see our, as, our concrete pavement, and if we zoom in to a point here, or maybe you can rotate the view around, we will see that the bottom layer is also in there. Now what I want to do is create or apply a linear template along these edge pavement lines to develop my shoulder and my grading. Uh, so to do that, what we need to do is also create another template for our shoulder. So I'll come back into my template library and in my demo folder, I'm going to create a new template and I'll just call this one shoulder. And again, I'm going to use the ODOT uh, components that are already developed for this. So I'll go to the shoulders and the concrete jointed pavement. And I want to make sure that my steps are set on again. I'm not too concerned with my affixes again. You Again, you could apply uh, right or left uh, fix to your point names if you wanted to. Um, so I'm going to drag in this component. And you'll notice my origin point is kind of floating out there from where the edge shoulder is. That's because of the super elevation points that are in this. So let me place this and we'll take a quick look. Um, This point here in my shoulder has some super elevation rollover values assigned to it. And it's all based on this hinge point. Um, in this scenario, we're not too concerned with how this uh, super elevation will work out. But for the sake of um, keeping it simple at this point, all I want to do is I'm going to change my constraint value or my distance for this edge of pavement point. Uh, to be zero so that it moves over on top of the hinge point. You could also delete the hinge point. Um, and if I do that here, you'll notice these uh, points change in color, which means they're no longer associated with that point there. So at that point, I could move this. Um, if I wanted it to be here at, at the origin, um, and then I would reassign my breakover point. Um, but what I'm just going to do, like I said, is I'm going to leave it where it was. And I'm going to change the constraint uh, distance of, for that horizontal distance to zero. So now that my edge of pavement point is right on top of that hinge point. And, and I'm not too worried about this point here. We can delete these if we didn't really want them. Um, or I'm just going to leave them in place. Now my edge of shoulder in this case is six feet. So um, I'll change that here as well. And we could also add some labels here and control this with parametric constraints, just like we would in a normal corridor. Um, but I don't need to at this point. And so I'll close that. Next, I want to add in some sort of grading or some end conditions. 
So I'll go to the ODOT end condition folder and I'm just going to go use a two to one fill slope. I think everything here is in fill. And uh, I'll change my graded shoulder offset to, I think five feet is correct for, for this case. So there I have my shoulder template with an end condition. And you could apply as many end conditions as you want, and you could come in and you could test those just like you would with any other uh, template. So let me save my template library and go back to my modeling detail tab. And now I want to apply a linear template. And I could turn off some of these things. It makes it easier uh, for me to see. But you also notice uh, as I hover over these edge of pavement lines, those are the only ones I'm able to select anyway. So I, I can leave some of these things on. Um, so I'm going to select the first uh, line that I wanted, my first edge of pavement line. and so if I wanted to change my template, I could, I could select the there and apply it. So I'll accept my template. Now it's asking me my start station. And I just want it to be the beginning of my edge of pavement. So I can press the Alt key to lock my begin, my start station. And I'll do the same thing. I'll press Alt to lock to the end. Now as we move my cursor from one side to the other, you'll notice the uh, it's asking to select basically which side I want this to be on. So I'll select my right side and I'll accept through the remainder of the, the defaults there. And I'll repeat the process for my radius return as well. So there you have a quick way to apply um, a linear template to develop a shoulder. You could add curve in this case, or in a, if you needed it, um, you could apply any other grading. Um, we got a little bit of an issue here, and maybe a little bit of an issue here. Might have a little bit of a cut situation, but um, we're gonna continue through at this point. Now, by keeping both of these edge pavements uh, lines as two different elements, you probably already noticed I had a little bit of an overlap um, with each one of these uh, corridors that end up getting created for the linear, linear template. I guess I should back up a step here. Each one of these linear templates essentially creates a corridor um, for that linear template. So you can modify these um, just like you would any other corridor. And you can change you could change the template if you needed to. You can apply parametric constraints and point controls, all those sorts of things. So, um, okay, so back to this overlapping uh, corridors here, or te linear templates. When I go back to corridors tab, um, I want to apply a uh, corridor clipping. So I'm going to add a clipping reference, and it's going to ask me to select which corridor I want to be, uh, to be clipped. And I don't really care which one I clip, so I'll just select this first one, or the, the one with the radius return in it. And then was, it's asking me to locate the first clipping reference. So when I select this other one and accept it, or excuse me, reset, you'll see, now you still see that the template uh, boundary shows up there, but now you'll see that there's this corridor has been clipped to the limits of this corridor. So lastly, just to show how this all came together, we'll take a look at a dynamic cross section. Uh, so if I right click in my plan view here and get my view control menu to pop up, um, and this selects four views, plan, profile, cross section, and 3D. Uh, it's going to prompt me for a dynamic view for a profile, and I'll just select the saw cut line. Probably didn't need to show the profile in this case, but uh, now, now I'm ready. I can go ahead. Oh, okay, select uh, dynamic section. So I'm going to select. I'm going to use the saw cut line as my 
corridor that I'm my alignment that I want to use. And now what I can do is um, I can either enter in the offset that I wish, uh, or I can just data point. I'll just pick two points. Now it's going to ask me to um, enter a station to start, and or I can just pick one on the screen. So I'll just data point close to the beginning, and I want my sections, let's say, every 10 feet. And then I will select the view I want, so my bottom right here. So as you can see, we can begin to see our cross-section or our pavement. So we have our widened area, our shoulder, and we're in that section there. The, the grading didn't work out. And now I have my graded shoulder and my two-to-one fill slope. Um, in my 3D view, I'm, I'm, I'm not seeing my existing ground in my section, so it's because it's turned off in my 3D view. So um, if I go back to my level display, and it's turned off the reference. So let me turn that reference file back on. And there I have my existing ground again. So I can scroll through and I can look at my design, I'll look at my model, and see what kind of errors come up. Or to see how good it looks, one way or the other. Okay, so there we have it. We've modeled our intersection, our widened intersection here. Uh, I'm not going to do the other side, uh, but the same steps would, could be repeated for ramp B and or uh, stay route 149. Okay, so um, there was a little bit of editing that was done there, uh, but really, I'd say in a matter of a, an hour or two, you could repeat this process as long as you're sort of familiar with um, the geometry commands and the uh, and creating some templates. Um, so the the next slide I'm showing here is when I created or um, when I joined those taper line and my edge of pavement line together. Uh, if I didn't do that, I, I would have, when I created a, a or applied a linear template to these, uh, I would have ended up having a little bit of a gap there. Uh, we could have came back and edited that later or joined them together. So I was sort of thinking ahead, knowing that that might be an issue, but that's what that would have looked like. So now that we have our model created, uh, we can go ahead and, and create our intersection detail sheet. And these are going to be the steps that I'm going to use again in my demo. Uh, I want to create a, uh, a file to do this in. And as of the time of uh, preparing for this presentation, we're sort of discussing file naming and workflow for creating the name boundaries and collector files. Uh, what I'm showing here is what we had currently decided upon. There may be some tweaks later as we uh, work through some of that and uh, create all the documentation or update the documentation. So uh, that'll be up or happening here soon. So be sure to check any current documentation when you, when you get to this point. Um, and if there's any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a GI000 file, and that's going to be the file that I'm going to use as my collector file and my uh, name boundaries. And we've decided to go with the the drawing code and the 000 um, uh, file number in this case. So that way they're somewhat, it's associated with your sheet files. And you could use a GP or a GA or whatever uh, file type you're creating. I do want to make sure I'm using uh, the design seed or a design 2D seed. And then I'll attach all the reference files I want to be used for uh, or to be shown on my sheet. Um, so the GI000 will be a collector or a container file for all the references. Uh, I would also recommend that live nesting not be used on any of these. So if my previous example, I used a BK000 file and let that attach all of the geometry that was already created. So I think there was four files in total. Um, I wouldn't suggest that, and 
this case when I'm doing my sheet, um, you start adding too many levels of live nesting, it's going to get, it can get very confusing very quickly. So then I'll adjust, um, once I do that and I attach everything, I'll adjust my uh, level display as, as it needed. Once that's done, I'll go ahead and create name boundaries from the drawing production tab, and then we'll create the GI001 sheet uh, from the name boundary. And then at the end, we'll add our annotation. And uh, I, I think if I understood the request correctly, they wanted to see how to clip out the existing topo um, on their intersection decode so that they could see where we were tying into existing, but not show it where the proposed pavement was. And then we'll use the Ohio DOT intersection details app to annotate the radius returns and the edge of pavement lines or the elevations that will show. So as I mentioned in previous slides, uh, we want to create a GI000 file, or uh, this can be whatever series of drawings you have. So maybe you're using the uh, one alignment is using the 000 naming convention. Maybe your next alignment might use the 100 or 200. In my case, I'm, I've been using 900 series for my presentation, so I'm going to continue with that here. Um, as of the time of creating this design uh, files app, wasn't quite updated uh, to include the 000 file type. So that'll be updated here soon. Just be sure to check any documentation as you're working through these steps. Um, before I start, I'm going to check and make sure that open last created file is toggled off because I need to, I'm going to need to rename a file. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to filter by the GI file types. And like I said, I've been using the 900 series. So I'm going to go ahead and select that here. Toggle on that I want this file to be created and I have the 901 suffix here. But what I want to do is end up creating or renaming that to 900. Uh, the application won't allow me to do that at this time. Uh, so I'm going to leave it at 901. And for our seed file, it's, it's, uh, we need a design seed to create our name boundaries and use as our collector file. So I'm going to change it from the sheet seed 2D to design seed 2D. And then I hit the create files. Then I'm just going to jump over um, to my Windows Explorer here, and I want to make this be 900 for this case. Again, as my slide showed, it was GI000, um, but in this case, I'm using a 900 series for my file type, so I'm going to, I'm going to go with that. Um, I'm sure we'll notify everyone once that um, app gets updated or automatically be pushed out. Next, what I want to do is go ahead and open the file that I just created. So find my GI. GI 900 drawing in my sheets folder. And again, keep in mind this was created with a design seed. So now that I'm here, um, I can go to my Open Roads Modeling workflow and open up my reference file dialog. Go ahead and attach a couple files that I need. I'm going to want to attach anything that I want to show up on my sheet. So first thing I'm going to do is add in my survey field book. And then I also want to add in from my roadway face maps folder. I'm going to add all four of these alignments individually. And I'm not going to use the collector file from the project. You know, to explain why in a second. Uh, I'm also going to make sure to attach any of the modeling files or any other reference files or base maps that I want in this case. Um, 
my KM901 is the one I use for my ramp A. Um, I also add in the others for this. Uh, so my KM001 was one that was already created for the project. So I'll add those for now. If I wanted any drainage files or anything else, any other discipline-based maps, I would add those at this point. Um, so now I'm attaching my field book file. And for pretty much all of these, I do not want any nesting turned on. When you add in nesting, it kind of complicates things, especially when it comes to your sheets. So, um, so I'm going to turn off live nesting for all of these files and go ahead and attach them. Now, I'm attaching now the BK001. In the previous um, exercise, my model, I attached BK000, which was a collector file which contained all of my base map geometry files. Um, in this case, because I want to, these are going to be in my sheets, uh, I don't necessarily want to have to have live nesting and have to go um, several layers deep in my live nesting. So I'm going to attach each one of these individually. The next I can fit my view and zoom into my project area. And similar to the previous video, the previous exercise, I'll go ahead and Go to my level display, and I'm going to turn off everything that I don't really need. And so in this case, I'll, I'll just turn on my pavement levels. For my geometry file, I'll select all four of those. And again, I'm only going to leave on the 100-foot uh, stationing. And in my model files, I'm going to turn off everything other than my proposed pavement. Keep things kind of clean here. And then I'll do a safe settings to make sure I don't lose anything. So now this view will be the view that will be attached to all of our sheets that we would create in this series. Uh, so let's say we had three or four sheets, or 10 or 20. Uh, Whatever is shown in this uh, GI000 or 900 in this case is going to be what's displayed in our sheets. And if we needed to turn levels on and off or change things, well, we would do that here. Now we're ready to create our main boundary. So we'll go to, from the open roads modeling, we can go to our drawing production tab. And then to the name boundary tool. So we'll do place name boundary. And we're going to use the plan, the civil plan option on, on the top toolbar here. And I do want to, if there's time or maybe in the future, I'd like to cover some of these other options. They could be useful in a case where we're looking at an intersection detail such as this. Um, but for now, we're going to focus in on the create civil plan. Um, so we'll, we want, for our drawing seed, we just want to do a plan only. And we want to set our detail scale. And that'll be typically 20 scale for an intersection detail. Next thing I'm going to do is identify the path I want to follow. And by doing that, I'll, I'll just go ahead and select the ramp A baseline. And then it's going to ask me to begin or, or enter a start location. Um, I want to enter 12 plus zero, 0. And then for my stop location, I'm going to click the the uh, arrow icon to the left or to the right that'll set it to the end of the path there. So that sets my uh, stop location at 16 plus 10. You could manually type those in, or you could date a point on uh, point on the on the screen to accept that point. Um, so now I'll go ahead and date a point to accept. And it's showing me my name boundary in white here. The length and offset uh, are set for the drawing seed, so you don't really need to change anything there. We do want to um, make sure that we have create drawing and show dialog next. So that'll give us the next step once we accept this. So um, 
you'll see that the boundary is sort of whitish in color here. Once I go ahead and data point to accept that, it's drawn into my file and it's kind of a grayish shade. Um, and then I get the create drawing dialog. So from this dialog, I'm going to start. I get, my mode is going to stay in plan. And my name, this is where I want to enter in my file name for my sheet. So I'm going to enter in my PID number and my GI. And I'm going to make this my 901 drawing. Um, if you wanted to do multiple drawings, it's going to just keep adding the next number in the sequence. Uh, I do want the one sheet per DGN. Otherwise, it's going to go ahead and create multiple models in the same file that I'm using. So it would create the model in this GI 900 file. Uh, you may find in some cases uh, that could be beneficial for you, but in this workflow, we're not going to use that. We're going to go ahead and create a, a separate drawing. Um, so it should have went ahead and defaulted to my roadway sheets folder, but if it doesn't, you can click the browse button and browse to the folder we want. So now my drawing seat again is plan only. I don't really need to change anything else. Everything here is um, set by the DGN library in our standards or our workspace. The only thing I do need to set is my um, scale here for my annotation scale my in my drawing model. Now when I move to my sheet model options, my annotation scale is going to say it's still going to say one. But my detail scale will need to say 20, or well, in this case, it was set by my name boundary. And when I click OK, it's going to go ahead and create the GI901 file for me. And then I have open model, so it's going to go ahead and open that model for me as well. So now let's take a look at the file that was just created. It's, it is in the gi901.dgn, and I'm in my sheet model. So this will be the model basically that we would plot from. Uh, I would probably not recommend too much annotation and stuff be done here, but that would rather be done in the drawing model. So uh, if we look at the models in this file, we also we have a sheet model which is the, what I have active right now, and we also have a drawing model. So the drawing model is going to be where we do most of our annotation. Um, and if I look at the reference files for the sheet, you'll notice that the drawing model for GI901 is attached. So the drawing model of my active file is what is attached. And then if I look at my drawing model, you will see that the drawing model, uh, when you look at the, the reference files, you'll see that it is referencing the GI901, and it's referencing the design model. Which there was only one model there, but that's the one that's referencing GI900. So if we wanted to turn off a level or edge pavement or add a level, we needed to come back and do that, we would do that in our GI900 file. You also notice that the drawing model for our sheet is clipped to match the sheet boundary. So then one of the other uh, points we wanted to make during this presentation was during the, the initial request for this topic uh, was to show how to clip out the existing pavement in this example. So we don't want to show the existing pavement here. So what I'm going to do is go back into open my collector file, my GI 900, and just zoom in here. And if I just use a, a scratch level and for this example, I'll just set it to something that can be seen easier. And then I'll just create a smart line or place a use a smart line to create a shape. You can snap to all these lines. I'm just going to quickly place a shape in here. And then I'll close that there. Let me just go ahead and modify the end. This end here. Now in my reference files, 
for my field book file, what I can do is uh, place a fence around this element or using that element, and I can do a mask reference in my field book file, so that'll mask that out. I suppose you didn't really need to do the shape. Um, you could have just placed your fence and clipped to that fence. Um, I might recommend the the placing some sort of scratch boundary there that you have you know, reference later, or if you needed to modify it or something, you had something you quickly and easily use to refer back to or to use again later. So now that that's done, um, because this is on a scratch level, it won't plot. I could leave that on if I want or if I wanted to, but um, let's say I just didn't want to see it anymore. So I can, in my level display, go ahead and toggle that level off. So now I see my, my shape file is clipped the way I wanted it to. And again, I'll save my settings here, and then I'll jump back into my uh, sheet file here, and we'll see that that should be clipped out. Oh, because, uh, because that shape was drawn in the in the collector file, I actually will need to go turn that off inside of this drawing model rather than in the uh, collector file itself. Now I'm ready to go ahead and start some annotation or some labeling uh, specifically labeling the elevations along the edge of pavement lines here or along my saw cut line. So I'm going to show two examples. Well, first will be sort of a manual method, and then the second will be using the uh, Ohio DOT uh, intersection details application. Um, so to start here, I'm going to label, I just want to label a couple of these edge of pavement elevations right here from, let's say, 14 plus 25 to 14 plus 75. Um, what I need to do is find the elevation along my edge of pavement, and I can do that by going back to my drawing model, or excuse me, my, my design model or my 3D model file, my KN file. And in my plan view, I'm going to use the civil analysis command. And when I select on my edge of pavement line, wherever I move my cursor, you see on the heads up prompt, um, I'm getting an elevation there. So if I move my cursor further away, it's giving me the station, which is the station along this element. That's giving me the offset, which happens to be the location of my cursor. So the further away I move it, my offset changes. And my it's also giving me the elevation of that edge of pavement line. Um, that has no effect on where my cursor is or where my cursor is in relation to the edge of pavement line. It's, it's always giving me the elevation along that edge of pavement. Um, so we could move in here and you know find the location we wanted and kind of move our cursor across it. But why not just use Civil AccuDraw to go ahead and get us the exact elevation along our baseline. So what we'll do there is let's, let's toggle on our civil wacky draw and I'm going to make sure I'm on my station and offset toggle. And then I'll restart the civil analysis tool. And I'm going to select the element I want to analyze, which is my edge of pavement line. But before I do, I'm going to press O on my keyboard and press Enter. And now it's going to ask me to select a reference line. And I want to go ahead and select the baseline of my ramp. Now if I key in, in my station field here, uh, 14 plus 25, and then I move my cursor out in the field, it is locking me in at the elevation of 14 plus 25. And notice no matter where I move my cursor, uh, the elevation stays the same. So no left or right, the elevation stays the same, 1194.75.
So what I could do here is go ahead and make a note of my elevation at this station. And then I could do the same thing and I can move ahead to 14 plus 50 and move my cursor and it snaps me into that location. Make another note of the elevation there and then do the same thing for 1475. So now if I go back to my drawing model for my sheet, I can follow a similar process for the annotate, annotating these three points. And uh, I'm just going to use the place note command. And I do want to make a couple of changes to the dimension style that I'm going to use. So in this case, I'm going to use the label leader line. And just as an example, if I place in an elevation and I just data point anywhere, one change I want to make is I want my text rotation to be in line. So if I reset and begin that again. Um, so now my text is in line with my leader. But what if I want it on top of the leader line? So I'll go in and I'm going to go to my dimension style. And notice that the text rotation has changed here to in line. We already changed that. But if I toggle on these bars at the bottom for my justification, it will go ahead and make the leader line go beneath the text. One other toggle you may have to do is go ahead and toggle on inline leader and you may need to play with the the length here, this value. Um, I guess I'll just set it to one for this example. So if I reset and start that, notice my elevation label is now in line with my text and my leader line is below the text. So um, let's go ahead and place my elevation at 14 plus 25. And I'm going to use Civil AccuDraw to get me so that I'm snapping right to that location. So I toggle it on, and I am on my station and offset command. And I want to press O again. And then I select the baseline of the ramp. And then I'm going to toggle 14 plus 25. And at this point, I do need to give an offset so I know exactly, so it knows exactly what offset I need to place it at. So I'm at 8 plus 0, 0. And in my text editor, I will go ahead. Oops. I guess I need to enter the, the text in first. And then I can data point. So my leader is beginning at my edge pavement line, my eight foot offset at 14 plus 25. Now you could create some construction lines to place these all nice and neat. Um, I'm just going to data point to accept this one. Now I'm going to do the same thing for the remainder of these. So 1194.18 was at 11, was at 14.50, eight feet to the right, data point, place my next label. And then I'll do my last one here, which was 1193.78. So you could do that manually or in the maybe in some of the locations where you just need to add one or two miscellaneous elevations. Um, that would be a good way to do it. Now, it's not dynamic. If you design changes, you'll need to come back and, and edit those. Currently, ORD has no way to um, place a label that's dynamic with those elevations. So the second step is going to be using the Ohio DOT uh, intersection detail tool. So to use this, what I'm going to do is I'll go ahead and delete these couple labels for now. And similar to the using the civil analysis, I need to be in the design model for this. So I'm going to go back to my KM file. And when I use this command, if I go to Ohio DOT and open the intersection details prompt, what I need to do is create a report that I'll use as my ASCII file. So that'll essentially be the input for this application to label these, um, to label what I want to label. 
So uh, I'm going to start by going back to the open roads modeling. And if I go to reports, I'm going to do a horizontal geometry report. I'm going to start with my um, saw cut line here. And I want to go ahead and lock the start and lock the end value. And then I'm going to set my interval to 25. So it's going to give me an elevation every 25 feet. And then I'll accept through these prompts and my interval and my, I want it set to my active profile. And then when the uh, report browser comes up, if I change to my vertical alignment, interval, station, elevation, uh, report, you'll see that I'm given a station and elevation. Notice that the station here is at 0 plus 0, 0, 0 plus 25. This is the stationing along that socket line, not necessarily the stationing along the ramp baseline. Uh, because my pavement widening began at an even station there, um, my 25 foot intervals that I entered are nice and even in this case, which will not be the case when we get to our edge of pavement line. So let's go ahead and we'll save this report and we'll save it as a text file and we'll put it in our engineering app folder. And for this case, I'll name this Ramp A Saw Cut. And then I'm going to do the same thing with my edge of pavement line. And then I'll browse to that report. I didn't get any elevations there. Okay, so I didn't get the correct elevations here. Everything gets screwed out. There was a slight error in when I did some of the modeling. Um, so let me go back and let's fix that real fast. When I modeled this edge of pavement line, I extended it beyond where I needed it to be, and then I trimmed it back using the MicroStation Trim command, and that creates what's called an interval on your on your uh, geometry there, your civil geometry. Uh, so you can see when I select that line, it extends past my taper from my radius and my, my radius return. Um, so what I need to do is remove that interval. Um, or probably what I should have did is more careful when I was creating this. Uh, so if I select my geometry, my prompts come up, I go to the remove intervals. Depending on how much you've done, if you notice, my 3D model kind of gets a little bit out of whack there. Um, that's okay for what I want to do right now. Uh, so now if I run my report, and I go to my active profile, you'll see now I have the correct elevation. So. I guess that's a lesson learned for me and for everyone else is that we'll need to be more careful as we, we modify that. I don't know if that's a bug in ORD. Um, I'll talk with the guys here and um, perhaps with Bentley to see if that's a bug in the program. Maybe we need to report that. Um, so now I'll save this, this report as a text file again. I'm going to call this ramp A, edge of pavement. And then I want to do a second one just to show you an example um, of another way to work with this intersection details application. Rather than locking the start and end, I'm going to um, give it, I'm going to define a start point on the screen. So with my heads up prompts, I could key it in if I wanted, if, uh, if I knew the exact station, but I'm going to snap to the end of this line or the beginning of this edge of pavement line, the end of the taper, um, because I know that this point is at 13 plus 25 from when we created it. So if I start there and I can also, I could lock the end of this one to the end of the alignment, or let's do this. Let's just go ahead and key it in. Um, one or two plus zero zero. And then again, 25 foot interval. So when I look at the report here, 
I noticed that that began at station 0 plus 50.64 of my uh, edge pavement line there. And that'll be important when we run this back through the intersection application. So let's save this one. And we'll, I'll just call it edge of pavement two. And then lastly, I'm going to run one more. And I'll get, I'm going to set my lock to start back and lock to end. And then I'm going to set my interval back to 10 feet. So I'm going to do my radius return here. I'll accept that. Then accept through the prompts. And then I'm going to save my report one more time. So now we're done here. Let me just uh, undo my one change. Fix my model back up with my interval. Now if I jump back to my drawing model and then I go to the ODOT workflow and to my intersection application. Um, I guess before I go too much further, you want to go ahead and check out the help menu. It'll define some of these um, other options and show you what, what you have to work with. I'm going to leave it at perpendicular with leader just for this example. Um, and then we will take and we'll select one of these ASCII files that we created. And so let's start with our socket line. And then I'm going to select the element I want it to label. So I'm going to select my socket line. And then once it's highlighted in red like that, we can process the line. So it'll go ahead and label all of those elevations from our report. Next, let's label our edge of pavement line. And we'll use the first option that we did. And I'll select this edge of pavement line and process that. Um, get a slight error. I'm not sure what that's about. Um, but now you'll notice if I zoom in at 14 plus 00, zero my edge of pavement elevation that I labeled is not quite exactly at 14 plus 00, zero like I would really want it to be. Um, so let me go ahead and I'll delete this run. Let me open this back up. And if I choose now my second edge of pavement uh, report, one thing I, before I go in, what I want to do is go in and look at my begin station. I'm just going to copy that. So now I have my ASCII file for my report logged in. Now my begin station, I want to be the station that begins my report begins at. And then I'll select my element again and process that file. So that didn't exactly give me what I wanted. But if I just do a quick undo, uh, let's try it again. This time I'm um, I'll enter my edge of pavement to, but I'm going to leave the begin station blank. I thought, thought we needed to add that in there, but um, in case I was wrong. So we we'll try it again, and we we'll process that. Now it's given me, because my report started at that station, now it's given me the elevation labels I wanted at nice, even 25-foot um, intervals along my baseline. Um, so we would probably need to come in and clean up a lot of the overlapping text and whatnot. Um, lastly, we'll look at the radius return, and that was the one where we did a report every 10 feet. So it's the same process. And I'll select the radius report select my element, and process my file. So now I have elevations every 10 feet along that. So you could do the rest, you could do the rest of the annotation like you normally would, um, clean up some of these. This application um, is kind of a, a stopgap for the, for the moment. We know there's some improvements that need to be made, and uh, those will be made probably in the, in the future. But at least this will get you some easy way to automate 
replacing some of these things, and then you can manually go ahead and update it. Again, these elevations are uh, are not dynamic with your edge of pavement lines in your model. If those were to be, if your design were to change, and you need to change those, you can manually you would have to come back in and rerun the report, or just update the or edit the text that you needed to um, to make it work. So, lastly. Let's go back to our drawing model, and we could have um, the rest of our annotation labeled in here as well. Uh, and they they pretty much have uh, a created final sheet. One of the last things I wanted to show was how to maybe orient my name boundary differently for the purpose of this sheet or any other sheet in that case. If I go back to my uh, to my file with my name boundary, my 900 file, and go back to name boundaries, these last three toggles are basically microstation defaults. And what we can do is um, we can place a boundary by two points or by a polygon. And that boundary is at the moment being taken from some microstation default DGN libraries. We're going to work towards getting that so that it's reading the ODOT DGN libraries and comes up with a boundary there. But I just wanted to show an example of what we could do. Um, so let's say if I chose the by two points option and so I can draw turn on. Um, I could pick two points on the screen and it would place a boundary for me. Now I would need to be careful that that boundary fit within the sheet border and that kind of thing. I could also use, um, if I toggle it on my um, AccuDraw, my MicroStation AccuDraw, and I could do RQ which will allow me to rotate my uh, AccuDraw position. I could rotate that better to get the, to maybe orient it through the intersection differently. Uh, or I could use the by polygon and I could go ahead and I could select the boundary that I wanted. And then whenever the sheet was created, it would actually flip that to that boundary that I created. Uh, so we're working towards that. You can look for something. We'll let you know when those sort of things get updated. So that's all I have. So as I mentioned in previous slides, uh, we want to create a GI000 file. Started playing again on me. Um, so that's all I got. There was one other way Eric and I were sort of playing with um, yesterday that we could annotate those by using some feature definitions. And uh, the advantage was it, it was dynamic, but we were we found too many uh, cases where that might cause, not that it's dynamic, the dynamic would be a benefit, but um, there were a lot of different ways that it, we could see it causing problems. So um, we're not gonna proceed with that at the moment. We, we might look into it further in the future. So. Uh, that said, uh, I guess we'll open it up for any questions or anything that JD or Eric want to add on on top of what I just presented. Thanks, Matt. Um, so you guys are muted, so if you want to say something, just unmute yourself. Um, and the only thing that I have to add to that is that that um, that little VBA to do the intersection detailing. Um, like Matt said, it's it's you know a stopgap. We understand that that there's still a lot of improvement there, so um, we will be looking at updating it. But um, it's something that it's better than nothing um, right now. So if anyone has any questions, We always wonder if crickets are good or not. Or if they're not able to unmute themselves. <laughs>
You guys can unmute yourselves, right? Yeah. I guess there's three phone numbers that we probably have to unmute. Um, what well, you guys can use the chat. I don't see how to unmute someone. I have no problem muting them, but I don't know how to unmute them. Anyone see that? I thought maybe you could, on the participant screen, can you click the microphone? No, I guess you can't. <laughs> well, there were a couple of comments in the chat. Um, Thanks, Scott, and thanks, Ian. Uh, Garrett, looks like um, maybe you can give that a try and see if that'll, that'll work better for you. Okay. Um, well, if you guys have um, questions or comments um, and you weren't able to chat or speak up, you guys can, can email us. Um, so um, we'll see you guys in the next next CAD meeting, or webinar, rather. All right. Thanks, guys.